everything. Yeah, I'm ready. Good. So we're live. Were you waiting till we went live before you sat down, or you're just unsure right now? You're basically, he's thinking, he's like, I'm not sure if this is going to be worth my time or not, so I'm just going to stand there and make Daniel feel uncomfortable. <laughs> All right, so welcome to uh, Unset. I am Daniel Norton. This is Dave. Got Chewy over on the master mixer thing over there. And uh, we're going to do um, a demo, I guess we'll call it today, uh, for you guys on basic photo lighting. So uh, for those who don't know, uh, which is what we're waiting for. Uh, we stream every Thursday. So if you're at home or at doctor's office on a date, visiting relatives, you know, whatever, you can't come in on a Thursday at noon. We do stream. So if you go to uh, youtube.com slash Adorama TV, you'll see the live stream. So every Thursday I'm here, we stream. If I'm not here, then we don't um, because then nothing's going on and you would just be looking at an empty space. Um, otherwise, if you don't know already too, we also have the Adorama TV uh, YouTube channel that has lots of small videos. So we spend most of the year producing short videos, two to five minutes-ish uh, long uh, with photo tips and techniques and these uh, that are much more condensed. So if you're looking for very, something very specific, you may find that there. Um, and of course, it's not just me. I'm just one of many. Uh, you got Mark Wallace and Gavin Hoey and all kinds of great uh, Marcin. Um, I'm probably going to forget saying somebody. They're going to feel really bad that I didn't mention them. So all the great hosts. Um, I'm trying to get all the commercials out of the way at the beginning. Uh, so yeah, check that out. So today we're going to do basic photo lighting. And I used to do something called 90 minute lighting school. If anybody went to that? No? Okay. I might bring that back. I'm not sure. But basically it was a much more kind of in-depth, uh, from start to finish kind of everything you might want to know. Um, it was a lot to pack into a short period, so I'm kind of breaking it down a little bit into several different uh, workshops that we'll do over the course of the next few months. This one is uh, going to be basic photo lighting. This is uh, our, the concept for this particular demo is that a lot of people grab a camera and they go out and they shoot and they might have a great eye and they're producing great stuff, but they want to, let's say, take it to the next level or there's things they can't uh, master, uh, they, the, the shots they can't get that they want to get, or maybe they are using flash and they just need to kind of understand how it works more so they can actually control it better. So we're going to actually start from, where are we supposed to have a model? Is one of you guys the model? No. No. Oh, interesting. Okay. So I'll be the model, I guess. Okay. I get to model again. I get that. Heather can be the model. You want to be the model, Heather? No, she can't. She has to work. Do you want to be the model? Okay. I'll call your agent. All right. So how about, uh, well, huh? No? Okay. I never, uh, Okay, I couldn't immediately think of her name as she walked by, and now I feel bad. Yep, you don't know the Okay, so the, uh, the, the girl walked by, who I talk to every single day, and for some reason I went, my mind went blank because we're streaming. So anyways, there's no model, but we'll figure it out. Um, basically, what we're going to do is walk through kind of starting with, a, with the no flash and like how you probably already operate, right? And then we're going to... Uh, talk about some basic uh, simple lighting, uh, starting with constant light sources, uh, and then we're going to go to flash in the end. And now kind of as we walk through it, hopefully you'll see why you may want to start to use these things um, and what might be appropriate for you in your next level. Please feel free to ask a lot of questions um, because this is going to be shaped around what you guys are looking for. So, um, so anyways, to, to start off, I will try to say every bit of equipment I'm using, but I'm sure I will forget. So. That's the other thing. Ask me if you don't know what I'm using and you have a question. We're using an Nikon today. It's a D810 um, with a 24 to 70 lens on it. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, for the purpose of this, if you have a Canon, you have a Sony, you have a Fuji, uh, a Leica, Minolta, Olympus. Am I naming them all? What else? Hasselblad. Whatever camera you have, it's all basically the same. Phase one. Um, phase one. So. We've basically a, a kind of a, a standard camera setup. It's a, it's a full frame DSLR. Um, we're, we're using a, a kind of a normal lens, the 24 to 70, pretty common stuff. Um, if we want to work with this, we can take a lot of great shots. This is a great little kit you can walk around with, right? We've got 2.8 lens, which means that we could shoot in relatively low uh, light. Uh, the cameras are decently good at high ISO, so we probably could get a shot, you know, even in this light in here pretty easily. I guess I'll be the model, so I'll step over here. Okay. So if we're gonna like take a picture of me, um, you know, we can simply use the meter in the camera. This is what you guys do now, right? You can either put it on aperture priority mode, which will just allow you to set your aperture. Um, you could set it on shutter priority. There's all those things. Um, manual, obviously, using the meter in the camera. 
and you'll be able to light somebody up. Like we're kind of in a situation here. There, it's not terrible light in this space because we're on a stage basically in a store, but you know, whatever. That was my pause for the shot, but nothing happened. Yeah. yeah. So Dave's figuring out the exposure. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up and we're gonna take a shot. Um, and then we'll start working with it, like adding to it and changing it for our, uh, I need a new Facebook profile shot, so this is going to work out perfectly. All right, so I am in Capture One right now. Actually, the lighting here is not terrible. Uh, I am in Capture One, uh, which we are tethered into as always, so you guys can see the stuff up on the screen. Um, I will say that neither one is exactly representative of the computer exactly, but this is probably closer color-wise. This one always tends to be a little washed out, but someday we'll fix that. You can see that we've got a couple of, of things going on here. Uh, we're, we're lit up nicely, right? Uh, by the by these backlights uh, there's a decent amount of light in here we are using two di you can see two different color temperatures going on you can actually see on my sleeve you've got some of the daylight bleeding in a bit um, so it's making it look more blue um, but you know that's not terrible right um, being that we're in this spot right but that's what we got right if i don't want that you know what am i going to do that there's really nothing to it if we shot in let's say less interesting light like let's say i stand over here this is probably bad i'll stand in bad light on purpose this feels bad like this. Although that light right there is probably like me. Nope. Right, so now we're, we're like kind of in worse light. Um, you know, again, it's not ideal. The background's too dark, whatever. You got weird shadows going on in my face, kind of hard light. But you know, you, you already know how to do this. This is the most basic stuff, right? What we want to do is bring it in. We have an idea of what we want our shot to look like, and we're going to try to create the shot that we want, right? And the most simple of lighting that you could possibly uh, get into. I am on a C stand, by the way. You don't have to buy this stand, which is very expensive. Um, this is called a photo flood. The, the, this, is, this particular one is a Westcott uh, U-Light. Um, basically, it's called a photo flood well, uh, type light because it has in it a bulb which is called a photo flood, right? This is your most basic lighting tool. Now, you can get things that look like this, obviously, at like a hardware store. You've probably seen them before. The only issue with using one like that, what you could certainly use, is that they're not made to handle the, the power uh, of an actual true photo flood bulb, meaning that this can handle, I think, 600 watts, at least 250, which is what we have in there now. Um, it probably says on the inside of it, which I didn't look at, but they, these, they can easily handle a 500, because they sell them at 500. So, um, yeah, it says right on 500 watts. Okay. So right here it says 100 uh, to 120 volts, 6 hertz, watts 500. So a fi this fixture can handle a 500 watt bulb. 500 watt bulb being very bright. If you go and you buy one in a hardware store, they're li usually limited to around 60, 90, something like that. So just be wary that if you are in a pinch and you need to buy one of those, that you buy the right bulbs for them, because otherwise you could have a fire. Um, this, the reason why I want this is because a photo flood bulb is t made for photography. They're tested. Not only are they brighter, which is going to be to your benefit, but they're tested to be properly uh, color consistent. So if you're working with, uh, you know, uh, a series of lamps, you're going to make sure all your bulbs are exactly the same color temperature. They're all going to be the same. Um, these happen to be 3200 Kelvin or tungsten white balance. So if we're using this light, we're going to basically set our camera to that. If this is our main source versus, let's say, daylight, which is on the cooler end of the spectrum, as we could have seen with the first shot with me where my arm was like a little blue. So this is really inexpensive, right? The actual fixture and with a stand and an umbrella and everything is like, I don't know, 80 bucks or something. It's not very expensive. Um, you, can, you can basically get pretty much the best color that you're gonna be able to get for, for a constant light source because you're using tungsten, which has great color rendition. Um, and a pretty inexpensive package, and it's, it's a pretty versatile thing. The only issue with these, to me, is that if you're planning on doing a lot of work, they don't tend to last forever. The bulbs burn out quickly, so you're constantly replacing them. They are about five bucks a piece, so it's not super expensive, but um, you do have that to deal with, but also just they're not made for professional use. So you're gonna grow out of this pretty quickly if you think you're gonna be shooting a lot, and then you might wanna step up to something, which we'll talk about in a minute. But as a starter type thing, these are great. Uh, they're very inexpensive. If you only shoot once in a while, or you just want to get into it. Um, we can take this now. If I just shine this right at myself, it's probably not going to be that pretty because this, you know, this circular thing is not ideal. The the reflector, um, but this is designed to take, uh, you know, tools, light shaping tools, if you will. 
So this kit, I have the two light kit here, which I think was $120, $130. Um, the, uh, the, something like an umbrella, right? Photo umbrella. So with a photo umbrella, we're gonna be able to shoot our light either bouncing into the umbrella or probably shooting through it is what we're gonna do since this is like a diffusion fabric. When we shoot light through an umbrella, it makes the light larger, right? A larger light source is a softer light source. So let's talk about that in a second, but uh, let's get this in here first. So basically, when you're dealing with light, right? A hard light versus a soft light. So we're gonna do a little definition since we're, we wanna make sure we're all on the same page. A hard light source creates abrupt, sudden shadows that have a hard line between what's lit and what's not. So if I have a hard light like the sun, if I'm standing out in the sun, there's a nice shadow. Hey, hon. This must be the model. There's gonna be a hard light source. I'm gonna get a, 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 my, my uh, what they call it, the loop of my nose is gonna be very defined, right? That can be great for some stuff, but it does, it, actually you can see here in my shot, if you look at this, right? I'm also winking at you there. If you look at that shadow, that's a hard light source. I'm being hit by a hard light, so I'm making an abrupt hard shadow. The, the light on my nose is hard. Yeah, this light is terrible for so many reasons. I mean, look at all the shadows going in different directions. This is one of the biggest problems with not controlling your light. You can see various shadows in different directions. That just almost never looks good on, on, uh, on people's skin. You typically wanna have a singular light source that's gonna just be gentle on the skin if you're making a portrait, right? So if I have a Becky, Amanda. Amanda. They told me it was Becky. I would have expected uh, Becky to be late, but not Amanda. So we have Amanda. Uh, you're just put on the spot. That's what happens when you show up late. Okay. Yep, this way. You have to face the camera. Yeah, there you go. So uh, there's like a 20 minute instructional that we give the models before we start usually, but since she was late, uh, she doesn't get it. Um, so basically now we've got this light. light. So what defines a, now a soft light, sorry, I get distracted because I'm making fun of the model. Um, a soft light has shadows that the edges are much uh, more spread out. They, they diffuse into the highlight, right? So it becomes, sometimes if the light is soft enough, like on a crazy cloudy day, you don't see any shadow, it feels like, because there's just like no defining line. Typically we want somewhere in the middle. The way that you control that is a larger light source is going to be softer, a smaller light source is going to be harder. And that's all relative to the, the, the subject. Meaning that this is much bigger than Amanda, right? Amanda's just got a, you know, a normal size head, she doesn't have a giant head. This is a big umbrella. Um, well, I didn't want to say you had a tiny head because that'd be weird. I think her head's like normal size for her body, right? Think, yeah, it's pretty good. So uh, that's pretty soft. If I took this umbrella though and I backed it up 50 feet, relative to her, it'd be very, very small. Think of like the sun in the middle of the day. You can block it with your thumb, right? Because it's huge, but it's so far away that it's small. So it's relative to your subject. That's very important because that when you start shaping light and you start going to the next level of this, you can start thinking about the idea of a smaller thing closer versus a bigger thing further away and how you can correlate those together to create you know, the light that you want. But just starting out, um, so we'll get, a, I guess, just a base shot with the, with the lights that are on the room. Now, photo floods are not tremendously powerful. It's only 250 watts, right? Of course, we're in, like, again, like a studio here, so we've got all these powerful lights on. This is probably not going to overpower the light here. We'll just turn it on first to see what happens, but we're going to need to close the windows and stuff to make this really work. Uh, no, well, let's, let's do it first, because the idea here is I'm going to walk you through. The, if I'm going too slow, let me know. I'm trying to be, like, uh, thorough. Plus, I haven't finished my coffee yet. You know, that's what happens. It's not drinking the cup. Oh, my computer died. Nope, capture one is like, pay for it. Nope, no, it wasn't. I think it detached, because I made that weird. Yeah, I probably, there you go. I forgot to bring my jerk stopper. So, uh, there we go. We kind of just jam the thing in there. Do you guys know what jerks? Do you guys tether? Does anybody tether? Nope. Yes, right? Yeah, I, I like went a long time without getting a jerk stopper, and now I'm like, uh, the, I was like, I finally broke down and bought it. It's, it's really nice to have. Um, basically, what it is, it's actually a thing that goes here that holds the cord so you don't pull it out. I just jammed it into the, the little do not steal me thing that was on the display. Um, so that's the light in the room, which again isn't terrible here because we're in basically a studio, but let's just fire up the photo flood to see like how much it adds. 
not terrible. Yeah. Okay, and we're bringing that in, right? And then we're gonna adjust our, our, our camera accordingly. And we'll start from here. We're just gonna kinda, we're, we're basically adding light to the space. This is one way that you might wanna work. You might be in a space where you can't turn off all the lights. Um, so you just have to kinda deal with it. Typically, if you're making a portrait, you wanna try to get someplace where you have some control, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll just say for now, this is our situation. Nice. So already, you know, did you have to make a change to the exposure? I, yeah, I just okay. adjusted the shutter speed to yeah. 200. So, so we brought the shutter speed up because we have more light, right? So just from that, like we're working with this kind of all over the place light that's in the space, we add just a very simple photo flood and we've already got a much nicer shot, right? The, the uh, she's happier now. Uh, you're controlling what they call the catch light, so we're giving her a nice like uh, brightness in her eyes where you might not have control over that if you don't uh, light it. We've got softer shadows, right? We can see the shadow here from her nose still, but it's nice and soft. Um, and we've got like a nice overall light. Now, just because for learning purposes, this, this light that you're looking at in this space is not just our photo flood. So I do want to eliminate these studio lights um, and close the windows so we can get a better idea of what the photo flood's actually doing so we can start to shape it better. Um, so again, if you were like at your apartment or in your studio or whatever, and you were lighting something, you would want to close the blinds, you want to turn off any lights you're not using, uh, get yourself in a position that uh, you can really have control over the light. There may come a time where you want to add those lights back in, right? Be creative with it. But for now, let's just kind of eliminate them. So can we uh, maybe kill the overheads? Yeah. All the people that are watching online will suddenly see me go dark. Oh, not suddenly, though. That was very smooth. It was like a smooth transition. So now, again, we'll adjust again, probably, I'm sure, because we've lost some of our light. Um, about a third of a stop. Okay, that's not bad. So, right, we can see now, too, the difference here because in the first one, because we had a little bit more light in the background, just naturally in the space, right, our shadow is not as prominent. And also, uh, you can see here that even though it's a, a soft shadow, it's much deeper um, in the second shot. And it's deeper because there's no light in the room filling in that, uh, that area. We can uh, eliminate that a little bit or help that a little bit by using the reflector, which hopefully is over there. I just pointed randomly and hopefully there's a reflector there. I'm not sure. Yep, they're good. This is a uh, portable reflector. Um, they come in all different sizes. I always say, because people ask me what size, get the biggest one uh, that you can. Uh, it's almost never, to have, never a bad idea to have a big one uh, because you want it to be bigger than what you're reflecting onto. And typically this is a good, you know, it's basically Amanda size. So it's got various uh, surfaces. You've got like, like a softer silver. You've got like a harder silver. We've got um, black and gold, right? So we have those options. Also, the middle part of this is, is what they call diffusion, right? This is useful, and maybe we'll use this in a second. You can take this and, re and replace the umbrella, essentially, with it. Basically, place it between your light and the subject, um, and then get, like, a, a nice, uh, nice soft light that way as well. But for now, we're just going to use it as a reflector. So the important thing with the reflector is to consider that the reflector is going to bounce the light back. We want to see where it's doing it. I'm going to use silver to make it really obvious. Um, you know, a lot of times people get a reflector, and they go like that. Right? This is not necessarily ideal because it's to the side. Right? I want to get light on the front of her to, right, to fill in nicely. So think about where your reflector is. Also, I see people do this all the time. Did you take a picture? I see people do this like this. Don't do this. Don't be this person. If I see you on the street like this, I'm going to kill you. No. Yeah. <laughs> the reflector goes like this. There's a very, very specific time where you might... Um, there we go, nice and filled in. So there's a very, very specific time where you might pull the reflector underneath like that, and that would be if you're doing what's called butterfly lighting, which we'll deal with in a more advanced thing. But typically, I, you hand somebody a reflector on the street, the first thing they do is they, I don't know why you're handing it to people on the street anyways, but let's say you're doing that, and they're doing that, and you're creating this like weird underneath light. Now, you want your light to feel natural, right? This is, the, this is essentially your fill light. Your fill light should not create its own light, it should just fill in the shadows. So my shadows are coming from my light source, which is over here, so I'm reflecting opposite, right? but still from the front. That's what we want to do. So nice and simple, right? Photo flood. We've got a nice even shot. Actually, the silver looks nice on her. Cleans up the skin um, really nicely with no shadows, right? And of course, depending on how you want to light it, you know, you can basically bring this in or out, right? I can basically put the reflector in nice and close like that and get nice fill. I can also back it up a little bit so it gives me a little bit less. I could use the white, which would give me less. So you got a lot of options there, right? Does that make sense? Nice and simple, really, really basic uh, lighting tool. 
And I will say this too, if you are just like, uh, you are still shooting with available light and you want to work with that and you had, let's say, a window that was lighting the person like this, the reflector is still beneficial. So if you don't have one, these are really good to have. Um, I think this is a Photoflex one. Yep. Um, I like the Westcott ones if you care what I like. Um, they're really nice. They're more expensive, but they, they are very nice. Um, the Illuminator ones, they're, they're, uh, they're six in one instead of five in one. Cool. Questions about that so far? No. Okay, good. That's easy. Um, let's just, for the sake of doing it, let's pull the, the umbrella off of this bad boy and let's, um, let's use the reflector, the, the diffusing part of the reflector. Because oh. I said it, but they didn't believe me. And then you yes. Can the sure. So if you haven't got somebody to hold the reflector, what can you do? Well, I know I, I only smile because people always say that to me, but I, I, have, I don't think I've ever found a time where I couldn't find somebody to hold the reflector. But let's just say that you're the last two people on Earth. You're making a photo of somebody. They're the last person. Or maybe your model's shy, and they don't, they don't want a random person standing there. Um, you could just take a, uh, what's called an A-clamp or, or a pony clamp and clamp this to a light stand. Because again, I'm not doing this, which would be hard to do. I could put it on a light stand like this and it would be perfectly fine. So an extra light stand with a clamp will hold it. Again, clamps are not very expensive. Um, like this is a pony clamp or an A clamp. Um, yeah, they're good. You know, you just go like this. In fact, we'll do it now when we do this. So basically, we can clamp it onto a regular light stand, however you want to do it, and we can just place it in. For this case, we're going to place it in front of the light, um, not as a reflector, but it's the same kind of concept. By the way, when you're using these, Try not to move them around as, as I do it uh, too much when they're hot, because that makes the bulbs burn out quicker. So people often ask me that. Because um, you, you will go through bulbs relatively quickly um, with these. Always have a spare. They're not expensive. I will also say, too, just as I don't have it to show, but um, they make blue ones, right? They're basically the same kind of light bulb, but they're painted blue. Those are 4,500 Kelvin, which are closer to daylight. So if you're working with a lot of window light and you want to fill in, you can buy those bulbs. Um, or you could put a blue gel over the front of this. There's a lot of options there. But if you're not worrying about the windows, don't care about that. I, I can't tell you the number of people who say, well, I want the blue ones because I want daylight. But they're shooting in a studio with no daylight. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. You can, you're using a digital camera. Just set your camera on tungsten. You don't have to buy the daylight ones unless you're mixing it. So now, this is now, again, we're shooting the, the light through. We don't have the reflector, obviously, this time. Uh, we're shooting the light through this uh, diffusion panel, which is still creating a, you know, a soft light. We can see the, the shadow edges of it. It's kind of interesting. Can we maybe move it a little more in front of her? And then you know what we can do. Right? See, if we had the Westcott one, we'd have another piece. That's why it's six and one. That's why I like it. Because you only have to buy one reflector, and then you have both things at once. It is more expensive, though, so I guess that's... Um, but this is still functional. Do you want to hold it? So you know, it's like a like a like a bullfighter. Okay. So yeah, so just bring it right in and watch where the light is, and not behind her. You want to get it on the front of her. Yep. Yep. So try to scoop that light up with it. If you're having trouble aiming the reflector, ask the model. They will know when the light's on them. They they can feel it. You go like this. Can you feel me? And then they they're like yeah. That's where that came from. Yeah. Questions? Yep. When do you use gold? Never. No, I'm just kidding. No, no. So he asked, when do I use gold? Gold can be tricky. Um, people sometimes use it if you're like, uh, they, they say to use it like in sunset um, type things. Like if the sun's behind the person because it's nice and warm, uh, the shadow side's going to be cooler, so the gold can help kick it back. My only problem with that is, if you don't reflect on every pit of them that's in the shot, so let's say I'm doing a full length shot and I use a gold reflector and I only reflect on this much of them, then the rest of them will not be gold. So be wary of that if you're using gold. I typically will use it in a much more subtle way when I don't, I'm not using a lot of fill, just a little bit. Um, oh, is that the new one? Oh, that was a good job. Nice, you've done this before. Earlier today he did it. There we go, see, there we go. We were trained him earlier. So there, we got very similar using basically our reflector kit here. And you see how easy it was for me to get somebody to do it? There you go. 
Good job. Thank you. You'll get free candy on the way out. What, Dave has an idea. You want to bounce off of it? Okay. Oh, oh. That, that's advanced. We're going to do well, next week. So uh, we have to save some stuff for next week. Okay, so that's really, really simple, right? That can be just about any light source, and it can be any light source. So later on, we're going to talk about flashes. This exact same setup, we could put a flash through this. It would look just the same thing. There would just be other advantages which we'll talk about. But um, yeah, so gold is tricky. I usually use it. Uh, sometimes I'll use it when, light, when I'm going to like bounce a little bit of light off the ground or something for like a little effect. But just be weary that we're, if the gold becomes your primary light source and it's not lighting the entire person, then where they're not lit is going to not be gold, which could be weird. Um, having made that mistake uh, a long time ago, I try to stay away from it. Um, for those situations. So if somebody's like completely in the shade and I'm lighting them with the reflector, I rarely use gold just for that reason. But if I'm just using it as a little bit of a fill, I'll use it. Or there's also soft gold, which is a little bit more subtle. It's a mixture of silver and gold, which is, you know. Um, the great thing about digital is you will be able to see it. So definitely if you start using gold or any other color in your shot, look at it a little bit before you make your decision to shoot all your pictures. Um, cool, all right, so an upgrade, if you will, to this uh, is something like, that uses a halogen type light, light okay? So I, my go-to kind of uh, company for this kind of stuff is a company called Lowell. They're, um, they're in Long Island, uh, actually, and they make a lot of different lights. This happens to be a Lowell Pro Light. Um, so the Pro Light is now more expensive. This is gonna be like closer to a couple hundred dollars. Uses a halogen lamp. Halogen lamp's got 400 hours of light, life, right? So. If you shoot every single day, $5 a day buying those lamps, $20 for one that lasts you, you know, most of the year, it will actually be cheaper to buy a better fixture. They're also smaller, tougher, can be repaired, have resale value, so, but again, much more expensive to get into. Um, so if you're just doing it once in a while or you're just starting, Photo Flood's a great way to start, right? If you know you're gonna be doing it for a while, uh, or doing it on a professional level, you might want to upgrade. This is what I was, I call this the entry to professional because it's not tremendously expensive, but it's definitely a pro level piece of equipment. Uh, this is a pro light. Well, it's a pro light and it's a pro thing. Um, it's not what we're going to show you right now though. We basically have a kit. I think our kit was like 800 bucks or something, roughly. This is a Lowell three light kit that includes two of the pro lights and it also includes a Rifa. Now the Rifa light is a soft box. The reason I'm going to show the Rifa is because I want to show you a softbox, and that's what I have. So a softbox is basically a light shaper that is designed to give you more control, right? It basically is a box, right? And all the light is contained within it. And then in the front of the box is diffusion, right? Which is where the light comes out of. This gives you tremendous edge control. The Rifa is designed to be set up really quickly, as you just saw me do. Um, you can see my bulb in there. Now, the bulb is sitting outside. You guys, well, you probably see better if I put it in there. You can see the bulb is kind of floating in the center. You see how it's kind of in the middle? That's going to give me light all around the inside of this, right? Because light comes out of the side of the bulb. And then it's going to come forward through the diffusion, which we'll put on there, give us a nice even source. Even is important when I'm going to put it close to somebody. And this is small, so if I want to keep it soft, I need to put it close, right? If I take a regular light, like let's say the pro light, and I put it in a softbox that's the same size as this, it will not be as even because the light is pushing itself through the back and hitting the diffusion. So if you're going to use softboxes a lot, this is a nice uh, selection because it has that uh, kind of nice even feel to it. Um, again, this is tungsten, uh, 3200 Kelvin. It's 250 watts, uh, which is the same as the other one, which is great if you're like traveling around because when you're going to start plugging stuff into people's outlets in their house and stuff. You don't want to necessarily use a lot of power. Um, that's why I recommend the whole closing of the window thing. If you want to start battling daylight, you're going to need a lot of power with constant light. Questions so far? Answers, maybe? No? Okay. If anybody has any answers, I will take those as well. All right. So this is the Rifa. Again, a Rifa is not cheap. Rifa is going to cost you about 400 bucks ish, three something, 400 bucks. Um, you can get this stuff used too, so keep an eye out for it if you think you want to get it. Reefers are also something you can rent, so if it's something you want to just try, um, you can do that. Um, so, advantage to a softbox. 
Well, number one, in order to make it soft, because now look at the size, her head didn't get any bigger, right? But the box is smaller, so we gotta get it closer in order to give us that same soft light. Light being closer to her is gonna make it automatically darker on the background, right? Because the inverse square law, right? We did a video on this, so if you, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time with it, but if you check out the video on adarmatv.com, you'll see that. Um, basically, the light's closer to her, further from the background, the background's gonna get darker. Also, we have edge control with the softbox. Right now, it's gonna hit the background a little bit. Um, we could actually get it off the background by turning the softbox, which we'll do in a second. Let's just start with this. This is kind of classic uh, 45 degree, if you will. We're gonna, uh, we'll fire the light up. All right, so now it's lighting her. This is a softbox. The light is closer. It's in a smaller fixture. It's probably brighter, I'm guessing, right? Which is good. Because the brighter your light is, the less the light in the room will affect your shot, right? So if you don't want the light in the room, like we don't want, like we're going to turn these off again. Uh, we don't want them to affect our shot, right? Oh, just, well, we'll take one with them on because he just did it. Take one with it off just so we can see the difference. I'm curious how much it's actually affecting. I don't see it. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's affecting it that much at all. It'd be, it'd be interesting to see. Yeah, tiny bit. Tiny bit. It's bringing the background up a smidge. Cool. All right, so there it is, right? Softbox, classic kind of portrait light, nice close. She's smiling because people love softboxes. You put a softbox in somebody, they smile, right? Background's a little bit darker because of the inverse square. We can get the background darker by turning the softbox so it doesn't hit the background, right? And because we're using a constant light source, we can see it, right? So we literally can just turn the box, right? Now, it might seem weird to turn the box away from your subject like this, but you're looking through the camera, you can kind of see it. We're probably gonna have to use a reflector to get rid of some of the shadow, but we should be able to get a lot of this light off of her. We'll take it without it first. Obviously, we're eating up light, so it's gonna be darker. We can adjust for that. Um, I can see through my, just looking at her, that there's gonna be a shadow on the side of her face. That's okay, we'll deal with that in a second. I lost the reflector, I don't know what happened to it. I think I keep giving it back to Dave. Right, so you get a few options though. We can use the reflector or she could actually slightly turn towards the light, right? That's also gonna affect the shadow. So maybe take two so they can see the difference there. This is called feathering the light, right? We're, we're using the edge of the light to light the subject. Yeah, right? So the light, the background's much darker now. Again, we got a little bit of shadow there, but it's not too, too bad. Um, we're using the, the, we're feathering the light. I can actually bring the reflector in. Because I want to keep the background darker, I'm going to actually try something. I'm not going to unfold the reflector. I'm just going to keep it small. I'm going to see if I can, if it'll be enough. Might not be. Oh, that might be enough. Yeah, let me know. Right? So the reason why I want a smaller reflector is because, I filled it a little bit, is because the bigger the reflector, the more light's gonna bounce back onto the background, obviously. Yeah, yeah we got a little, bit of, a little bit of lens flare because we're pointed at the lens. We should have a lens hood, but the lens flare is okay. We're living with the lens flare right now because we don't have a lens hood. Uh, questions? Right, so this is what a softbox is for. Softbox is about control. Obviously, we could also move her further from the background. That also helps. Umbrella's great. Big and open, inexpensive, softbox gives you control, right? right? So now if we move her further from the wall, right, we can see where the shadow is on the wall. So I can literally just turn the light and try to get most of it. I can see it on there a bit, but I think it's okay. We'll see what it looks like. Are we flaring still? I'm trying to also kill the lens flare. We're probably going to get a little bit of a gradation. We are further from the background now, so we'll see. Yeah, we got a little bit of gradation. It's not not a lot, but a little bit, right? You can. It's not completely black behind her on the on her shadow side, um, but it's pretty pretty good. Questions? No. This is pretty all very clear. It's so confusing you can't even come up with a question. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. An octobox? 
Well, right. Well, an OptiBox is shaped differently. So it's going to tend to be tend to wrap around a little bit more, which means it will also probably hit the back the background a little bit more, so you'll have to turn it slightly further out. But yeah, you might end up getting less shadow with an octagon just because of the shape of it. Sure. Because it, it would be physically bigger, you know, because of the shape of it. If it was if it was the octagon is either going to be bigger than this or smaller than this, if, if you know what I mean, because it can't be the same size. A two-foot octagon is actually like this, right? It's much. It's got all this edge here, right? So if you're using an octagon, you're going to get a slightly larger light source, which means it's going to wrap around more. Uh, also makes around catch light. Some people like that better. So yeah, it's certainly useful. But remember, it's on both sides, so you're just going to have to still turn it out further. Um, w working her towards the light worked really well. We can also use the reflector. You know, and again, now here's where I'm going to break the rule that I just told you not to do. Like I said, don't put it next to her. But if I go too far to the front, I'm going to bounce it back. So I'm going to kind of cheat it a bit, almost sideways, and not tilt it in as much. I think that'll be OK. Right, we want to get a little fill. Yeah, nice and flat, but with a black background, right? Background is black because none of our light is hitting it. No matter what background you have back there, if no light hits it, it will be black, right? Easy as that. Questions? No, okay, good, we're cranking. I love it. All right, so that's that, right? Now, you will find yourself in positions where, and I don't have one, so we're just gonna talk about it, where um, you want your room light to be part of the shot, but you're using a constant light source. If you're doing that, you're gonna have a few different options. The simplest one, although not the most perfect one if you want correct color, is to use a dimmer, right? We're actually showcasing how this is eliminating the light in here, but if I wanted to use some of this light in here, I could lower the power of this light. There's a lot of different ways to do it. You could plug a dimmer into it. A dimmer basically um, will lower the, the power. People have probably used dimmers before, right, in your life and houses and stuff. The tree just dimmed me. Um, the problem with the dimmer is when you lower the power using a dimmer, it is going to make the light warmer. It's going to change the color temperature. So be wary that you're not going to have exacting color if you start using dimmers. The other thing you can do is you could put what they call neutral density in front of the light. There's a, it's a gel, just like there's ND or neutral density filters for your camera. There's neutral density gels that can go in front of a light. They're in very specific uh, f-stops, uh, you know, one stop, two stops, three stops. So you could basically put the light up, set it up for your subject, get, get a reading for the room, and then add neutral density to knock it down. You could also use a less powerful light bulb, and most of these fixtures are able to take those. So keep that in mind. That's how you're going to mix your light when you go into an environment. Like this Rifa, like if we go this way, let's shoot out to the audience. Right, if we take the Rifa. Now, you know that I didn't say, right, even though it will definitely work, moving the light. The reason why I didn't say that is because I'm assuming that the, your light is in the position that it needs to be in to give you the light that you want. In other words, if I love the way the light looks on her face when my light is right here, if I back that light up, it's not going to look the same. So that's why you want to change the intensity of your light. It's not because you can't move. I mean, maybe you can't move it back, but not because of that. Right? Moving it back and forth will change its, its uh, feel on the person. And you want to be in control of that. So get it to look the way you want it first, then deal with the rest of it. It's pretty simple just, just to go in there and get the light set up, make a photo, right? And let's say, for instance, we thought that the background was too dark here. We could then make a couple of photos. We know what this f-stop is. We could make a couple of photos, let's say, two stops brighter, right, which is going to make her overexposed. But if we like the way the background looks, then we know we have to bring this one down two stops, and we add two stops of the neutral density, and now we're where we want to be, right? It's just a matter of balancing. It's all about balance. We're not going to do it because we don't have that neutral density, but that's basically how you would do it. But simpler than that, and probably a much more versatile and powerful tool, would be to use a flash, right? So a flash is something that uh, you know, is probably should be one of the first things that you pick up uh, as you start to light things. It's, it's small, a small flash, I should say, like a speed light. I'm looking for it. It's hiding because it's so small. There it is. OK. Speed light or a small flash, right? This is a little tiny flash. I have the Nikon one because I'm using a Nikon camera. This little flash is more powerful than any of the lights that we've shown by a lot, right? This little flash can eliminate this, the light in the room. So I can use this guy, which fits in my camera bag and runs off batteries, and I have to plug it in, um, basically to do similar things to what we just did. We could put it in an umbrella. 
We could shoot it through the diffusion. We could do a lot of different things with it, right? Um, it also has, uh, if you're doing events and stuff especially, uh, the capability of what's called TTL. So TTL is a metering system. It means through the lens. Basically what it is, is it means that when you're in flashes in TTL mode and you set your camera to wherever you want it. So for instance, let's set the camera to get the, the room looking the way we want. Like using like, I don't know, whatever we want. So we'll get, you get the room looking the way you want. The flash will automatically compensate for it. We can leave that on. Actually, let's leave everything on. Yep. Yeah, I'll just turn it off and just put it on top. So basically, Dave's going to get an exposure for the room the way that he wants it to look, or however he likes it. And then we're going to turn the flash on, and the flash should, should, always, right, when you deal with computers, it should automatically give us the proper exposure. Uh, right. So let's say that we like that. We like the background. It looks great. Um, she looks good. We don't really love that light that's on her face. We're going to try to flatten it out a little bit with our flash. Now, let's just say, uh, we're going to use, actually, I don't actually hate the light on her. It's a little underexposed. Um, we're going to use what's called fill flash, but first we'll just put the flash on and see what it does. I mean, do we like that? Do you like that background? Do you want it to be brighter? Or darker? Oh, can you bring back up for a second? No, I mean the picture, so they can choose. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, do we want the background to be brighter or darker? Oh, hold on. Hold on. This is the shot you want to avoid. Okay, so do we like it uh, background-wise, brighter or darker? Darker. Okay, so we want a darker background. So we can close down, I don't know, we want to close down, do we want more focus or, or what? Do you think we have enough depth of field or do you want like you guys to be a little bit more in focus or the background to be a little more in focus? Because what are we shooting at now? We're at like, we're at a 2.8. Do you want to shoot like an F4 or something to make it darker? Or do you want to go faster on the shutter speed? Let's go to F4. We'll close it down a little bit. We want to see the store a little bit more. The temptation is often to shoot as wide open as possible when you have the lens because it costs you a lot of money. But um, your lens is typically not its sharpest when it's most always wide open. Um, and in addition to that, um, if the person moves, they might slightly be out of focus. So when I'm shooting this close to somebody, an F4 is probably a, a good spot to be in. So let's say we like that. Do we like that, or is it not dark enough for you? Anything I want. OK, well, I like that. So since, since the audience has given me approval, um, we're going to shoot there. Now, we've got a couple of things going on here. Do we have any chills? OK. OK, good. Ah, perfect. Yeah, that's yeah. So we've got an issue. Our flash is daylight white balance. Right now we're set, I think, on tungsten probably. We're set on tungsten-ish. So if we like the way the store looks, it, as far as color and exposure, and then we use our flash, she is going to look very blue, like sad, because because the flash is blue, relatively speaking. That's a chocolate or something. Uh, what we need to do is make a choice, right? Flashes, all of them, I grabbed the one off the display so I don't have it, but when you buy these flashes nowadays, they come with color correcting gels that you guys probably all just threw back in the box and don't ever use, but that would allow us to match the light in the room. Or if we can't do that, then typically I will sacrifice the room for my person. I'd rather have my person look good than the room if I have to make a choice. So I would set my white balance on flash. But we're gonna go for it, that looks right. We have an orange uh, gel, uh, CTO it's called which we're going to uh, manipulate the flash to make it more warm, to hopefully match the space. So we've got our flash. We're going to put the gel in front of it, and we're going to make a shot. Once we have the shot with the flash, now this is on camera flash, it's not necessarily going to look the best in the world. Um, we can adjust our flash power to make it feel the way we want, right? We can, we can probably, I'm probably thinking we're going to use it more like what they call a fill flash, meaning we're going to let some of the shadow from this light stay because I don't hate it. Um, and, but we're gonna fill it in so it's not so dark. In order to eliminate it, because this light is brighter than the store, we'd have to make it basically black back there, which we could do, but if we like the way the store looks, we've gotta make the compromise of, uh, of that. Okay, so she's still a little on the blue side, even with that gel. Or maybe it's a half. Do we have another one? 
I'd double it up. I think it's probably big enough. Just fold it in half. It'll probably be enough. Okay. So basically, we're going to add uh, a little bit more because she looks a little washed out to me, a little bit blue. Um, Questions while we get the gel? Yes. How do you know what gel to use based on what? Well, there's a few different ways that you can do it. Um, you could either, so he's asking, how do I know what gel? Um, well, I try to generally, if, I, if I'm, especially if I'm working quickly, I'll either work in daylight or tungsten, and then I'll, if, and then I'll just add a tungsten if I'm using a daylight flash, right? But if I shoot the room and I don't like the way it looks in tungsten or daylight, then I might use the Kelvin scale. Uh, if I use the Kelvin scale to set my exposure, I can then uh, use whatever gels I need. Basically, they are all given in uh, amounts of Kelvin that they compensate for. So for instance, a full brings you from 3200 to 55, a half, some other number in between. It says it in that people uh, get those little gel books that people often take and they pull the gel and they stick it on their flash. Those books actually tell you. So don't throw away the part that tells you and keep that part and you'll have, yeah, there we go. So this is a gel book. Um, which has all the different gels, and it will actually say inside of them what it does. So this, for instance, is a, oh, look, I even went to this. So this is HMI to tungsten. Uh, this one here is three quarter. So there we go. Converts 3,600 daylight to tungsten 3,600. So basically, it's basically going from 55 to 36. You can just do the math. So if you, if you set your thing at 36, that's what you do. And there's all different levels, and they do add up. So you can actually, oh, much better. You can actually uh, put, like, two together. You just do the math, you know. Um, that looks pretty good, yeah. right? The flash is filling in the shadow, right, um, which doesn't look terrible. Although now that I'm looking at it, and the, even with the shadow cut down, it doesn't look that good. So I have a couple options. I could either... Um, overpower the light, right? Thus making the room black, but we like the way the room looks. Or I could basically just go like that, right? And just block the light from hitting her in the face. Is that blocking her? Yep. There, yep, there it is. Right? Another use for a reflector. Be weary of all the light in the space. You can see it, right? So, yeah. Again, ask somebody, a waiter. Somebody, you know who you ask? Whoa, you're looking very orange there. You know who you ask is the person who walks up to you and says, hey, what are you shooting? Hold this. Right? Woo, that's really warm. Okay. It's a full, okay. All right. Good. Cool, there we go. Right, now I've eliminated it. Now, of course, on camera flash, this closed, it's providing a hard light source. Hard light source because the shadow under her chin, this is not obviously using a flash on top of your camera is not necessarily the nicest looking light, but this is more of a demonstration of how to mix it. You can make the light on your camera much nicer, and I'll go over that in a lot more depth when we do an actual speed light day. I don't want to spend a lot of time on that, but you can make it look great. Um, but one of the simple things you can do uh, is take it off camera. Do we have time for that? Let's skip that for now, because uh, I'm going to go to the big strobe. Do we have the softbox? Okay, so using the same principles as we use there, right, we're going to use an actual uh, studio style flash, right? We're probably still going to have to use that to trigger it. Oh, no, you got the trigger, right? Yeah. Oh, perfect. So basically, if you, can, if you look at this thing here, let me bring it out for you. This is a flash. But a studio style flash. This is a Profoto D2. This is very expensive. You don't have to buy this one. There's all different levels of these. You can get them much less expensive. This is a high-end pro model. But this is the one that I have. Um, basically, this is a flash, right? Um, the runs, I got to plug it in to make it work. We're going to be able to take this light and add modifiers to it, which are going to allow us to shape the light and make it look much nicer, whether that be an umbrella, whether that be a softbox, which is what I think we're going to use, um, and, and what have you. So let me set that up for you. 
I mean, if you're getting into doing uh, more serious lighting, you definitely want to invest in some kind of a on, uh, off-camera or studio type style flash like this in, for long term. They can be rented. Again, there's different levels of them. You don't have to start with the most expensive one. Um, this is what they call a mono light, meaning that it's completely self-contained. So I just have to plug this guy into the wall and it will work. I haven't actually tested it, but it should work. I took it off the display. We'll see, you have faith, right? Amanda has faith. Basically, we're just gonna plug this guy in. We have total control over the power output, um, so we can set it to the exposure that we want, just like we did here, right? So now it's like, well, we want the room to look a certain way, we'll do exactly the same thing. We're gonna light the room up using the light that's there or get rid of it, depending on what we want. And then we're gonna activate the flash, which is then gonna light our subject in the way that we want the subject to be lit. Questions about anything before I go any further? Dave's building a softbox, if you're curious about that. Oh, advantage over small flash. I guess I'll get into this. Couple of things over a small flash. Because you could theoretically take your, your speed light and put it off camera the same way we're about to do this. Way more powerful, right? So why does that matter? You may be in situations where you need more depth of field or where there's a lot of light in the space that you want to get rid of. Also. The light is going to recycle, meaning it'll get ready to shoot again faster, the lower the power setting you have it set on. So if I have more power in general, I can turn the power way down to match the speed light, which means I can shoot really, really, really fast. So if I'm shooting children or people that are reacting really quickly and, and having emotion and stuff, this is going to allow me to shoot really, really fast. You know, if you're shooting a still life that you're taking a long time to shoot, it's not going to really, that's not going to matter to you. Um, the power will probably matter more than that. Oh, interesting. Oh, that's why. See, after I made the joke about it not turning on. All right, so this is in two. So I can basically... This is 2A. I'm setting this up so that it'll go. So now I've got my... little machine on the back here. I'm setting up the radio inside of it. Okay, so basically I've got a, what's called a modeling light, right? So that's like a constant light source. You can see that. This is going to allow me to aim it, right? It's going to make it much more precise to use. I can aim this thing. You could theoretically even use this modeling light, I guess, uh, as a shooting light, although I don't know why you would ever do that. Uh, maybe there's some situation where it would be useful if you, if you want to shoot like a high ISO for some reason. Um, and then you've got the test button here, which will allow me to fire the flash and we see that it fires, right? And even at 7.3, which was pretty high in power, it only took uh, that little time that took to beep is when it was ready again. So, right, very fast. Questions? No, good. Coffee break. Does anyone here have lights that they're using now and they're just trying to get better at them? Yep, what do you got? Oh, oh nice, Flashpoint, that's the house brand here. So Adorama loves you. So yeah, Flashpoint's very inexpensive. That's the, the Adorama house brand. So if you're starting out, you can get a mono light um, for a couple hundred bucks maybe, less than that, depending on how much power you get. Um, pretty decent, you know, for, for the money. So Dave's putting it into a softbox. Um, soft boxes for strobes are basically an accessory. You buy the soft box and you buy what's called a speed ring. The speed ring fits the light that you have. So this same soft box could go onto your strobe system, for instance, with the Flashpoint speed ring. Um, or if you have like Speedatron or Novatron or something Tron, Norman, Dynalite, Bron Color. I'm trying to name all the brands so they don't get Ellen Chrome, thank you. Some other kind that we have, uh, pho uh, photogenic. There's lots of different brands. So again, same concept, diffusive material, edges here, so we have control. 
It's bigger than the, the, the reefer, so we could actually theoretically back it up if we wanted to or get it in closer for even softer light. Cool. So now, um, let's just shoot against the dark background, I guess, so we're not blinding them. We'll try not to flash you guys. So basically, again, like we did before, we've got the softbox. We can place it wherever we like. This is probably more or less in front of her, getting a nice light across the front of her face. By the way, this one happens to be rectangular, and you can. Don't be afraid to turn it sideways. People, for some reason, don't like to turn them sideways, but you 100% can turn it sideways. It doesn't hurt. It might work for your wraparound thing that we were talking about. If I'm, if I had the light this way, I could also flip it on its side, which will give more light in front of her, which will help with the wraparound. So if you're doing that kind of stuff, that can really work, especially when you're feathering it. Um, this does use, I think, this has TTL, right? So you could actually try the, this particular strobe, which is, this is not that common in big strobes, um, does have TTL capability as well, so we don't have to use a separate light meter. Um, we just can't go uh, black background, like, and kill the ambient? Yeah, let's kill the ambient light. Okay, so, thank you. I usually start this way and I'm ending. So when you're using this kind of flash, one of the keys to it or that, or that I always say is when, you want to be in control of your situation. So the, the beauty of this flash, even though I could mix it with all the light in the room, this is really designed to get rid of that light. So what we're going to do is we're going to set our camera to get rid of all that light. We're going to set our, our ISO low. We've been shooting at 400 ISO all along, I guess. We've been shooting at 400 ISO. We're going to go to 100 ISO because we have tons of power, right? We're going to go to the maximum speed in which the camera will sync with the flash. Every camera is a little different. This one's 250 because we're using an icon, right? Then it comes down to setting an aperture somewhere where none of this ambient light affects the shot. So around probably 5, 6, or F8 is going to be good. Um, I don't care if the background's in or out of focus because it's just a plain background. So I'd rather shoot with a little bit deeper focus so their whole head's in focus. So F8's probably good. I have tons of power to spare, or I should anyways. We'll see. And when you're doing this, the, the, in order to test it to make sure you're doing it right, is you turn your flash off and you make a photo, right? And this is what you should get, right? A black frame, black frame. That means none of the light in the space is affecting my shot. All the light that we see from this point on will be from the flash. And that's what we want. We're in control now, right? Is there a little bit there? Well, yeah, she has like a reflection of her airing, of her, yeah. Yeah, that's okay, we'll learn more about it. This is like a specular highlight off of her, uh, but basically, yeah. Or earrings, but basically black, it's a good. Now, when we use the flash, assuming the TTL works correctly, we'll get a proper exposure. If it doesn't, we'll adjust for it, and I'll talk about that. TTL is not always 100%, just like when you use the meter in your camera and you're walking around, it's not always exactly right because there's different factors that, that uh, affect it. Um, but it's usually pretty close. Now, this is daylight white balance. We switched, right? Daylight or flash? Okay, or flash. Um, it's flash white balance. So if we had left it on tungsten by mistake, it would be very, very orange. Yeah. Boom, there she is. She's lit, right? So now we have a proper exposure. We have a soft light coming across her face. We have a dark-ish gray background. It's not black because, again, some of this light is hitting it. Um, we could feather it off and do it like we did before, but this is going to give us a nice, clean exposure. This is at... Essentially, this is action stopping speed because uh, when the flash is not, you want to do something action packed? Yeah, you're going to do something? What are you going to do? You want to jump? Okay. She's going to jump. She's very excited. How are you going to jump? Are you a jumper? Okay, nice. So, this light will stop her action. We're shooting it, it doesn't matter what we're shooting at. We're shooting at a speed that none of the light in the room is affecting the shot. That means the only speed you have to think about is what's called flash duration. Flash fires for just a fraction of a second. Plenty of time to stop the action. So if you're shooting something that's moving, you're doing pours with food, you're doing kids, you're doing people jumping, uh, you're doing Amanda, right? Not that way. Um, so, so Dave backed the light up, I guess, so that to give a little more spread since we've got some action going on here. We should have plenty of power. I would just go straight up. That way, well, I don't know, whatever's easier for you. Are you more of a leap forward kind of person? She's more of a leap forward kind of person. Can you land on the same spot? All right, good, she can do it. We did not ask her before this that she would do this at all. Yep, just land on that spot. Yeah, there we go. Oh, two shots even. Touche with the two shots. Boom, right, so she's frozen. Right, and we can see that the flash 
you know, very easily freezes her hair and her and her earring. It's all very sharp. I mean, it's not the best shot in the world. No. But, you know, it's, first, it's the first one out of the box. Now, we did actually back the light up to make it a little more even, so what that created was, of course, more light in the background, right? So, you know, you can play around with that a little bit, but you get, you get the gist of it. So, incredible speed, right? Shooting fast, killing the light in the room. That's really what you want the, the strobes for. It's gonna give you that ability. It's gonna cost a lot more, so just keep that in mind, too. It depends on what you're doing. Uh, other questions before we take a little break? Yes. If none of the light in the space is affecting the shot, it wouldn't matter. It could be at five seconds, right? Because as long as none of the lights in the space, now obviously at five seconds, that's gonna be hard to do unless you're in total darkness, but you could theoretically go into a completely black space, open the shutter with bulb, and then just press the flash and it would freeze the action because the flash is only firing for a fraction of a second. So yeah, well, it could be as slow as you want. I mean, it could be 60th, 30th, whatever, and you can do, and we'll do this next week, but boy, I like the segue. I should give you a little advertising money. There was another question, though, first, right, before I do my segue? Yes. TTL, right? Yeah, we use TTL here, right? Yeah. yeah, did a pretty good job. They got a pretty good TTL system in this, in this light. Um, again, TTL is just through the lens metering. If you buy a less expensive flash system, it doesn't have that. You just have to do some test shots. It's not the end of the world. You don't have to have it. It's, it's convenient. Um, it's just another way to meter. Uh, it makes things a lot faster because we didn't have to come in here with a light meter and do some tests, you know, so theoretically too if she was moving through the space It would light her differently as she moves so she'd keep a good exposure uh, assuming it worked You probably do that really quickly like yeah. just walk from the back and Dave could take a series of shots sure. And theoretically it should give the same exposure so the same being the yeah, just walk like step 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 and just shoot um, While I do the wrap so basically um, Speaking of that though There was a blink. Yeah so we see the lights generally. Now again, TTL is not perfect, right? So they're not, they're not exactly the same, but you see it made a decent exposure no matter where she went. The power of the light shifted depending on where she was standing, right? And it did a pretty good job. And if you're shooting an event, you're shooting people moving and you need that, it's done. If you're shooting somebody standing in one spot, maybe manual is better for you because you don't want it to change. So you're gonna have to you know, decide on that yourself if you have that functionality. Um, but anyways, next week, we're gonna talk about things like a pop and blur and multiple pops and using longer exposures with flash to show different effects like her jumping through the air and having showing multiples of her or her hair slightly blurry. We're going to do that next week. That's going to be the advanced flash class. Um, same time. So if you guys want to come to that one, that's really fun. Or we stream it at, uh, at noon if you can't make it. But if you don't come, then Chewy gets sad because he likes his full space and keeps, keeps him motivated. Um, David doesn't really care. So don't worry about David. <laughs> <laughs> but any other questions before we wrap? No. All right. Good. So I hope that it was helpful. We're going to be back at two, pretty much doing the same thing. But if you didn't get it or you just want to hang out, I will be there. Uh, I'll probably say some other different things because I never remember exactly what I said, but uh, pre pretty much the same thing at two. Um, next week, advanced flash. So please come to that if you're interested. The week after that, just in case you don't come next week, I'll give you the heads up. We're doing uh, a dialogue. So if you guys are interested in filmmaking, that's a really fun one. Or if you just want to come watch some actors do their thing, we basically shoot a dialogue live. Um, in the store, and we've been pretty successful. I think we've managed it every single time, which is pretty pretty good. Um, we basically go through the whole process, we light it up, we shoot it, um, and it's pretty fun. Uh, Ari will be there, so we'll be using some of their new stuff. Ari, for people uh, who don't know, is a lighting company slash camera company um, for the filmmaking industry. So thanks for coming, guys. Mm -hmm. You get a clap.